Hey, how are you? Okay, hi there. Hi, our speakers and panelists are here. Let me just make a quick introduction. Hi, welcome to the Global Metaverse Carnival 2022. I'm Loretta Chen. I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of Smogless Studios. We are the first investing studio of uh, the Sandbox. Uh, it's headquartered in Singapore, and we've you know brought a lot of experiences like DBS, um, the Food Bank. Uh, we also onboarded uh, Nima, Son, and Figo into the metaverse. So super exciting times. But enough about me. We are here today to discuss the next evolution of Web3 and the metaverse. And uh, to do so, we have uh, a bunch of really esteemed panelists. And for full disclosure, it's 3 a.m. for me here in Miami. So we'll meet our panelists today to do all the heavy lifting. So let me just introduce them in tow. We have the CEO of Virtua, who is Jawad Ashraf. I'm going to just wave to everybody hi. Let me just read out a little bio. Jawad is a technical specialist. He's an entrepreneur with over 30 years of experience in st strategic planning, process engineering, project leadership, business development, with a keen mobile AR, VR, blockchain focus. He has also worked in insurance, reinsurance, energy trading, risk management, and SaaS cloud-based systems, as well as mobile applications. He has also managed and built projects in the UAE, and he's now based in Dubai, uh, in USA, Turkey, Australia, Norway, and the UK. So welcome, Jawad. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, yeah we were both lost just now in another metaverse. We were, like, we were like, we were like, in another metaverse. <laughs> I know, it's good to just find you. So we also have uh, another CEO. Uh, Romel Carlos of Arcus. Hi, Romel. Good to see you. And Romel is an experienced CEO with a demonstrated history of working in, in IT and services industry, innovation development, business operations, big data, Splunk, data analysis. He's got strong business development professional, uh, and he has a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science focused on IT from System Technology Institute. Welcome, Romel. Where does this find you? Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm here currently in the Philippines, so ah, 4 p.m. our time. So very decent um, time. So yeah, you do all the heavy lifting. I'll just ask you all the difficult questions. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next up, we have founder, managing director, Bushir Ahmad, who is from FinStep Asia, a very uh, distinguished bio. Bushir is in the financial markets. He's an assurance advisor at Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority better known as Vara, obviously. And he's, I, I imagine you're based in Dubai, right, Bushir? Yeah, are you based in Dubai right now? Are you, are you there right now? Are you in Dubai right now? I am in Dubai right now. Uh, ah, um, okay, of course. Yeah. And, and quick, I'll just- Yeah, and a quick disclaimer as such, in the sense that any, uh, all my comments and views are strictly my own personal views, not of my current employers or previous employers. Together. Thank you for that, and and we've recorded that, so we'll make sure of that. He was also the formerly he was also the former managing director of FinStep Asia. And in the last seven years, he's worked closely with several regulators, government bodies, on fintech, digital assets, digital economy policy, providing advisory research work, and delivering workshops on various topics. Mushir has also found time, in spite his uh, busy schedule, to contribute to building the fintech ecosystem in Hong Kong. Uh, and sits on several advisory boards. He's also a mentor advisor to several startups, as well as co-founder of India Tech HK, a platform bridging Indian and Hong Kong SAR startup ecosystem. Welcome, Mushir. And I'm last, but of course, and last but certainly not least, we have co-founder of APEC DAO, Nicole Ung. Hey, Nicole, where does this find you? Hi, Loretta. Hi, everyone. Very nice to see a lot of familiar faces here. Oh, I'm tuning that... in from Bangkok, yes. Oh, you're tuning from Bangkok, great. I'm so glad yes. to be acquainted with you for the first time. So Nicole okay. is currently the co-founder of APEC DAO, a Web3 community centered around um, Asia Pacific, and she's the ASEAN Vice Chair of Global in Impact Fintech, or GIFT. It's a think tank. She's been a key organizer behind a series of community outreach initiatives in Vietnam, APEC, including the first Vietnam Blockathon, the first mass scale conference in Vietnam Blockchain Week for over 2,500 audience, as well as Enigma, a blockchain business contest. She now co hosts the Unblock event series in Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam, and also co author of the first Vietnam Blockchain Landscape Report and upcoming reports for Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines. And she was the former head of APAC for Asia Blockchain Review and Infinity Blockchain Ventures. So, again, uh, welcome to all our panelists. Uh, super excited to have you. I'm super 
super excited because I know I can count on all of you to do all the heavy lifting today. So let's get started. Our panel discussion is on the next evolution of Web3 and the metaverse. So maybe I'll just, uh, just by starting, I'll just toss it out to anybody um, and then just feel free to jump in. But maybe my first question to all of you is, you know, how will Web3 impact the future of work? Anyone wants to take that on? How will Web3 impact the future of work? Or what do you think is the next evolution of, of Web3, the future of work? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Jawad. Yes, please. Okay, so so basically, look, um, you got various layers to Web three. So you have got like the technology components that are going to be disruptive in various industries. So you've got all the fintech stuff. You've got all the game. Um, you've got game files stuff that's going to impact it. So this is the way that you use it. It's, it's a utility around with Web three. But then the other part, which is the future of work, is going to be the metaverse itself. And it's how you're going to participate and be present in work environments as well. And the social layer. So I think Web3, you're going to see, you know, we all know around the table that there's going to be so much disruption happening. That's sort of happening in baby steps now across everything in finance and everything. Um, supply chain, there's so much that will happen. And that will touch every industry, a bit like when we moved from physical to digital. You know, everything was disrupted. Pre-PC, it was all on paper. And now it's, now it's all digital, but it's going to be the evolution of that in a decentralized way. But the metaverse part is really important because it's how are you going to be present in the office? Are you going to be an avatar? Are you going to be in social spaces? How is your networking relationships going to happen? How will your meetings happen? So I think there are two core pillars to the way things will change in Web3 and the way it's going to influence. It's, 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 it's earth shaking, I think, but that's what will happen. But anyone else, what, what's your opinions? Yeah, anyone, Romel? What's the evolution of Web3 and how does it impact work, Romel? Yeah, so actually uh, for me right now, the our evolution, right? Uh, we are still in the early stage, right, of the Web3. And there, there's a, a lot of um, still of, um, experiment uh we're still on an experimental stage and what we we can really do on the on the metaverse and the it let's take one example industry of the game pie um one of the high uh last year it opened our eyes on the game pie industry where in we can take ownership of our asset when it comes to game pie industry um but the real questions on how we gonna how it's gonna impact us right now for me as a gamer also is um if this is my professional work, how it's going to impact me? How am I going to remove those um, third party, some other agency that cutting some of my um, profit from me as a professional gamer? And I, I think that's how our um, game, uh, our uh, web tree will actually help me directly working, cutting down the middleman, but we're still going to ask ourselves as a builder now how we're gonna create a sustainable ecosystem for Oof. for our for our community and that how we're gonna maintain the liquidity be, that because right now there's really no perfect economics yeah. being built right now and it still boils down to the question of how we're gonna sustain the overall economics of our um uh, uh, blockchain system um by not really diluting the overall economics and going back to that work uh just one industry is still uh it's still revolutionary and we need really good builders that have really good vision that can disrupt the disruptive of web three technology mm. so right now it's really more um on the experimental stage and i would say that uh we really have a good uh, future for the web tree, but let's all help each other to build this good ecosystem that everyone will benefit and not just for some selective few people that manipulates the system. Yeah, great points. And in fact, I do want to come back to a question that you, you raised earlier, but uh, before we, we, I mean, you raised two really good questions that I want to raise to the panelists. But before that, maybe Nicole, you want to offer your, your point of view, like what do you think is the evolution of Web3 and, and, and how is it going to impact the future of work or, or any aspect of life, really? Uh, so I think the, the question around the future of work is very exciting because uh, I think, of course, uh, first, of course, it deals with the business and secondly, it deals with the people, right? 
because we are talking about the shifting of talents, how we are changing our, uh, I think our habits, of course, also our behaviors these days with Metaverse and Web3. Um, but personally, I think the most um, interesting or fascinating, uh, I think, model with mm -hmm. that comes with Web3 is about everyone can set up their own economies right now. I think this point has been stressed yes. quite uh, a lot in a, a lot of, you know, by a lot of the speakers, especially Yatsu from Animoka. And he also mentioned that, of course, the most powerful tool with uh, Metaverse and Web3 is that basically you can form a lot of these microeconomies. You can even set your own kind of governance. You can even uh, come up with your own crypt like currencies. You can actually work out on the incentives for the people. Of course, you can actually, you know, um, kind of have the ownership of the assets that you can generate within your ecosystem. Basically, this is not dependent upon any centralized parties to tell you which one is right and which one is not. Mm -hmm. And of course, you don't have to stand the, the risk of your assets being revoked. Let's say if you have to rely on a third party. So I think pretty much this is a very powerful kind of concept. I mean, even for now, we're talking about builders, as Romel mentioned. We talk about creators who can actually, uh, you know, create their own economies. And this actually, I think it's very powerful, especially against the setting of uh, Asia Pacific, where we yes. also have a lot of these like small and medium businesses mm. and also a very strong uh, kind of creators culture. Mm. And so I think that this is definitely something that we look very much look forward to. So a lot of the other innovations around, I think the DAO or Metaverse, et cetera, basically it drills down to what you can do actually as an individual or also as a community individual, you know, with Web3 and Metaverse. Um, there are m many other concepts, but I think that's the most fascinating for me so far. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Again, I want to come back to some questions that, that you raised there, Nicole, but uh, yeah, I think we, we lost our other panelists for a while. Um, so maybe I'll come back to a question that you raised, uh, Romel, like how, how do we build the system then? Because you're saying that, you know, currently, you know, there are some bad players and, you know, liquidity has been taken out of the system, right? I mean, obviously, case in point, FTX, et cetera, some of these bad players. Um, how then do we rebuild? How do we begin to uh, sort of, you know, future trust again after something like this? Um, so in, in, in removing the stigma from our, uh, to get the mass adoption from our community. So let's, re, um, how can we remove that stigma to these people is really creating uh, a good product. Like for example, let's take it, I'll, I'll focus on a game pie, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or um, in a game pie, um, if we're gonna build the game, let's, let's not forget about why game was being created. But this is for us to have fun to go back uh, to re, uh, to really remove our stress from the reality mm. and re, uh, be something that we can collaborate um, um, in a virtual world to our uh, to our uh, friends and to be friends globally. Mm. Um, so let's create that first, create that good product and services, mm. right? right? And then let's a second, and let's not forget about the fundamental how web to created a good company, a strong mm. company. And let's take that business model that they, they're being created. Mm. Their financial structure, uh, let's apply that to the Web3 mm. in order to create this sustainable product. And mm. the third one, I think it's really, since we are driven by the community also, um, I think this is the time to really maximize how the decentralized exchange works mm. and really use it more often instead of going to uh, right now the trust that we have really in the central exchange really become low because of the recent issues mm -hmm. um and that's how we're gonna bring back the trust of other uh, community mm -hmm. that actually mm -hmm. lost a lot when it comes mm -hmm. to cryptocurrency mm -hmm. um focusing on that for me I, I think that will help us to really get more mass adoption to the community and really uh, focus on something what the community deserve after all we our crypto is a billion dollar industry we reach to the point of the trillion right yeah. so let's create a good product and build more utility use cases out of it and that that's for me that's what how i can see how we're gonna improve more in the web3 space yeah good points uh, what about any thoughts then nicole especially in the work that you do with DAOs? i mean 
have have some of your committees been like severely impacted and how have you tried to reassure them or yeah any observations from from your vantage point yeah uh i think mushir is also asking to be back on the stage so if oh. uh, yeah if the organizing team can help him um so good. i think back to yeah the uh so i think we are like coming back to a very uh, interesting concept of dao uh to be honest i mean apac dao we didn't start as a dao uh in the beginning so we started as a community of people who have who share like you know kind of similar interest in connecting with other web3 players uh, and you know we are mostly in APAC, and after COVID, we also found it very, um, I think, very critical to, of course, like to get a chance to know other players and explore the the, the landscape, especially after COVID with Web3. Uh, and eventually, we were thinking that uh, so for now we've reached to a stage where we have like a thousand five hundred members from ten countries, mostly Web3 founders and VCs, community builders across APAC. So we're thinking that based on this kind of network, um, so actually it started with trust first. And there we're thinking of having some way to decentralize this trust by of course opening up to more people and we can build up some initiatives on it. We still have the meetups and networking activities, but we're also thinking of a decentralized launch path that's gonna be built upon this trusted network. So once we have like a core team or a core network uh, based mm -hmm. on trust, uh, we are going to work around the governance, the constitution of the, the DAO to make sure that, you know, whenever there's any new player that comes in, basically we can, of course, maintain this integrity, um, also the power of this DAO as a community, you know, intact, yeah. thanks yeah. to the, the governance and the supervision of the whole community as a whole. Mm -hmm. So I think basically, uh, I mean, the DAO is not for everyone or not for all business. Uh, I yeah. believe that it's also very... Um, challenging to build the trust uh you know among people especially after yeah. the fallout of the market recently um yeah. but i think what we witnessed recently is that of course a lot of the decentralized protocols are the first benefactor of that kind of fallout so people are moving from centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges they're also going for non-custodial wallets uh you know and of course like other kind of tools that require you to be the owner the ultimate owner of your assets yeah. so i mean definitely I, I would say that this is something that inevitable, like these kind of market fallouts where trust was, I think was uh, kind of battered uh, among all of these players. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a necessary step for us to kind of shift our mindset from, I think from the centralized world to a decentralized world. Yeah. I'm not like a decentralization maxi maximalist, but I believe that uh, basically there's a lot of loopholes with the current systems that yeah. if you kind of shift your mindset to a more kind of community based, uh, also decentralized uh, kind of way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Basically, there are a lot of opportunities that can open um, and and then be, and you can also like think about different ways to in incentivize people to have more trust uh, to build business. So DAO is one thing, uh, but of course, like, you know, everyone is feel free to welcome to kind of leverage your own network or your community yeah. to come up with other ideas. Yeah, uh, well said. I think uh, so. Bashir, uh, while we lost you for a while, I think I was asking our, our panelists on, you know, how do we rebuild trust in, in this in this um, climate? But maybe I'll pose the two gentlemen, Jawad and Bashir, a slightly different question uh, following what Nicole has just said. So, um, how? Because Nicole did also say about you know trying to involve the community. It was also something that Romel shared as well. So maybe to both gentlemen, Bashir uh, and then Jawad, well, how will and how can the community? Uh, play a part in this, especially in, in, in such a bear market? How do you think the community, what, what can they do for sure? I think uh, the key element when you're looking at a bear market or otherwise is, um, as, as Nicole mentioned, trust is a major factor, right? So when you're trying to build trust, transparency becomes very important and mm -hmm. verifiability, right? The, the whole element of blockchain uh, being the fact that you can verify something and then have that trust because it's a trustless system, mm -hmm. was an important element of the evolution of the ideology, right? And I think that's one thing that we need to get back to, is how can you verify and validate any information that's done, any actors that are done, right? The FTX collapse is a classic example of, again, trust there, right? That mm -hmm. everybody trusted what was being done. And so building the trust is uh, going to be critical, but verification and transparency mm -hmm. becomes the next part, right? Yeah. When you look at self-regulation, you also need to, uh, there, there are two elements to it or two plays. One being when you're looking at a fully decentralized mm -hmm. ecosystem, then it becomes a question of 
ownership and this shared responsibility mm-hmm. right so you do need a way where the bad actors can be uh, acted upon or you know I, i'm not going to say punish but i'm just saying there should be repercussions for any bad actors and there should be rewards for those who can highlight the bad actors like properly right? so oh. that becomes important to try to build that story up second mm-hmm. is quite often uh, um, in in certain circumstances people uh, push back against governments governments authorities mm. regulators etc right mm. um, and there there are multiple reasons why they do that but we also have to find the right balance uh, the reality is a lot of what's done on web3 can and may be regulated right some of it already is regulated as a possibility whenever it has to do with financial services that the regulators will see it but in the bear market there have been significant number of people Uh, and investors and users who have been hurt not necessarily mm-hmm. financially but otherwise as well right because sure, sure. Uh, do you have the trust in you know when you buy an nft and you think this is the next big thing you figure out it's a fraud because the the validation was not done by the platform and it was just a jpeg as an example right so for not only about the money but your trust in the system becomes important so collaborating with regulators in a way that this can be feasible and finding the right balance not all things need to be regulated in in all circumstances yeah. but being able to collaborate and be transparent what you do and making sure that the authorities are comfortable right mm. uh, this is not to say you need to be um, just be getting everything regulated it just means that those who can provide investor protection are and their duty is to provide investor protection and mm. consumer protection are comfortable what's happening in web3 and you know there are a lot of self regulated organizations in today's world outside of the financial services world outside of right. regulated world right and can we build such things where the trust can be there both internally in the groups that operate in web3 but also outside in because if everybody thinks that this is largely scam this is not you know legal or illicit activities are taking place no matter how much clean the activity is there always be a shadow upon it so being that transparency is going to be key okay. yeah so jawa what what do you think i think uh, now you know it's it's posing all these questions on what can the community do uh in in this climate but also i think moshir brought up a point about you know regulation as well so i just want to hear your thoughts on both is it going to be more the owners of say regulation or community i mean obviously we'll say a little bit of both but i just want to hear your thoughts on yeah, what's the I mean, role of community I mean, what's the role of governance i think everyone's like covered the covered the key points here it's going to be a bit, a bit of everything it, uh, yeah. um regulation ultimately is going to be very important or the mainstream will never come to our way we can't change the entire world's thinking right now crypto is this and this is the mass market and if if the approach that we take is we're going to educate you on a whole decentralized approach to life let's wait 30 years so there's got to be something in the middle which has got to provide trust in a meaningful way that mm-hmm. can evolve into something mm-hmm. which actually then works better for everybody and, and like mm-hmm. you know like like machines you know even uh, like I'm aware of what VAR are doing and that they're trying to create a regulated framework um for uh crypto and blockchain companies but in a way which is an onerous but i think a lot of what's going to happen is that then you know just as a blockchain allows us to have um trust uh, trust without no, no, knowing the details trust yeah. uh, trust uh, trust the transactions i think there needs to be something along the same way for DAOs and organizations to be trust the decision making Yes. behind organizations in a similar decentralized way it's almost like decentralized verification of business processes needs to be something that needs to come in as a layer because right now if you've got centralized company you can have bad actors if you've got a dao it can can end up becoming very cliquey and then that being its own thing I mean, you've seen it with multiple daos you know and just because it's a dao doesn't mean they can't collectively make bad decisions like that time when somebody bought a copy of dune i think for how many millions of dollars thinking they could make nfts from it the dao voted on it and they realized after they bought it they had no ip rights to it at all they just spent 3 million dollars on a book they could do so it's like there needs to be a, a middle ground and in my mind it's like the solution is going to be something which is about providing almost like a decentralized collection of daos and individuals who can work on a trusted basis who will actually be incentivized just like miners get incentivized to go ahead and come from a blockchain transaction yeah. they get incentivized to make sure that these things happen yeah. in various industries the way they should do and that does make it trustless again right because people are rewarded just like the shares talking about 
for, for reporting bad actors, but it can be also rewarded for verification of processes. I think there's a step we're missing. I think we've got bits. Regulation is trying to do mm. some stuff. DAOs are trying to do some stuff. I mm. think there's something else to the hybrid which will evolve mm. into this space to deal with this. Yeah. These things like FTX is just, I've spoken to so many projects that literally had their entire, I mean, you know, like you're talking about um, game, like game fire and you're publishing. Imagine if all your funds were sitting in FTX because you were, you were asked to do that by your investors and the next day you have no money. So it's affected all of us. It's not just the, it's not just the, like, the consumers, it's affected multiple companies in the ecosystem. So we've got to find a way to protect ourselves and the public. Yeah. Nicole, I mean, you, you obviously, um, you know, I'm very experienced in this space. What do you think of Jawat's suggestion um, here about working with the DAOs? And what are your thoughts on what Jawat just um, expressed? Um, I think definitely we can, I can echo some of the, the, the ideas of Jawat. I think especially around the incentives, because mm. honestly, I think that that's uh, one of the more efficient kind of drivers, you know, to kind of, to kind of put people onto a path of, let's say, desirable behaviors that we want. Right. So it's better than, of course, all the penalties and stuff. And even with blockchain, as I mentioned, so um, it's also a very powerful tool to come up with your own incentivization, uh, yep. how you, you can also decide how you want to distribute the rewards. And you can also, of course, have a community or a DAO to supervise that. And even for now, of course, with a lot of the tools out there with decentralized oracles, you don't actually even need a centralized party to kind of evaluate or verify any person's contribution to your project. Basically, all of the all of the processes ideally can be automated and can be, of course, like, you know, supervised as, as a DAO once you have the right governance structure in place. And this can be, of course, applied to a lot of the use cases out there. I think we have a lot of the DAOs, like service DAO, investment DAO. As long as you have a shared interest and a constitution that makes sense to all of the parties, um, basically we can we can think about a, a littlest kind of organization like that, uh, and that can help drive people forward without, I think, by incentives. Um, oh. The thing with the, the 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 bad actors, right? I mean, we we actually also kind of want to. Uh, use incentives as well for the community to be able to identify those actors at the same time. Um, and as long as you have some stakes or, you know, you have real stakes in the project, I believe that your main goal or your, your biggest interest is about growing that project instead of yeah. kind of, you know, you know, bringing everything down to mush. So, um, yeah, I, of course, I can relate to some of that. And I think even with our DAO for now, uh, we share the same kind of mission of uh, supporting the builders um, and I believe that um, as long as you set the right kind of goal the right case mm. I mean let's say the right milestones and the right governments you can actually gather and gather a lot of the people out there who can be mm. who can share the same mandate with you hmm. interesting I, I, I'm really enjoying uh, today's panel all of you are incredibly eloquent so uh, a couple of other questions that, that sort of came up from from your conversations uh, what then do you think is so all of you are either familiar with Asia or have worked with Asia or some of you are currently sort of tra traipsing about between Asia and Dubai. Well, what then do you think is, is the state of Web3 in, in Asia or perhaps where you are uh, in Dubai or elsewhere? But um, maybe I'll start with you, Romel. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, actually, I just had a panel discussion with our... Uh, I, I was invited in our uh, one of our government... Um, blockchain education to our community here in the Philippines. So um, the, the state of the web tree actually, especially here in the Philippines is really, really uh, huge. Uh, the, uh, I, I think the last statistics we have is we have 4.3 or 2.3 million uh, MetaMask user. Um, and we are one of the uh, top country that actually uh, adopted uh, having mass adoption when it comes to nft um and game five projects um yeah. in southeast asia so yeah. so in southeast asia alone i was actually traveling this past few months uh, i met nicole already uh, personally uh we've been uh we've also been a panel discussion in this metaverse uh carnival way back before a few months ago um i, I was surprised and um uh, luckily to see that um uh, personally this 
from Singapore to Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, um, and Indonesia, the, the community is really strong. And I think it will grow tenfold in the next two, three years uh, in Southeast Asia. Oh. And we, we, there's a lot of builders now also uh, in this space. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really a good position uh, for the other projects also to be really top the Southeast Asia market mm -hmm. and also see the good ones. Um, and the reason why we're also being uh, showcasing our uh, knowledge to the community is to really educate them uh, yeah. how to really spot the bad actors. And being yeah. in a IT, uh, one of my goal by next year is to develop a tool for the community that will create a, um, um, like an AI analytics that will provide them if it's a yeah. good project or not. Um, oh. Just to help them when it, to analyze the tokenomics, the liquidity, the project. So, so I think coming up with the right tools also to, to give from the community is really yeah. also one of the best thing. And we need someone that really going to step up on that, doing that for free, right? And yeah. I think by next year, if getting the right resources and funding that I have, uh, probably will will focus on that. Uh, we already have some ideas and draft some uh, tools about it. And if yeah. you guys are also welcome to hear those tools that we're pr planning to develop by next year, uh, it's ra really going to be a big help to yeah. our community to bring back the trust and yeah. they know the right project that they're going to be invested with. But yeah. it's really hard to spot. Just to this a disclaimer, it's really hard to spot we the recent issues that happened in a centralized exchange we really don't know right it's regulated yes. uh, it was being regulated by the u.s government or, yeah. um, and we we are all surprised of what happened so yeah yeah but, well, but well, that kind of in this incident is really hard to track yeah no it's true but sure what, what about you i mean what is uh, the state of web3 now in dubai i mean I, everyone i know not jawad and um uh, you're both based in dubai so i'd love to hear what both of you think but uh Mushir, what are, what do you go first because we've been hearing so much about like, go to dubai go to dubai so i want to hear what you think from from where you are habibi come to dubai i think that's the that's I the shall. Say, right? <laughs> yeah well look um i i'm 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 relatively new to dubai having spent the last eight years in Hong Kong, uh, largely, right? Um, so from a Dubai perspective, I think there's a lot of activity happening in terms of across Web3, uh, from uh, looking at, uh, you know, licensed regulated activity all the way to uh, having um, a variety of different things in the metaverse and you know, NFT, etc. Uh, Dubai is uh, at the heart of uh, the Middle East and mm -hmm. also provides you this ideal hub location for mm -hmm. bridging the east and the west, right? Um, geographically speaking, it's literally in the middle of, of the northern hemisphere, and that I think is a big advantage that Dubai has. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, parties who are setting up their uh, institutions across UAE and including in Dubai, right, from yep. well-known family offices to a big name um, companies are also coming in here. So I think that's one key element. And then you look at the, you know, the reach of Dubai, it's, it's two and a half hours away from India. It's uh, within three hours of all of the Middle East. And we're talking about South Asia. And if you just take MENA and South Asia, it's a very young population as well. Uh, yeah. And a lot of people who are native Web3 players, if you want to call mm -hmm. them that, I think that's a big advantage. And I, I'm very positive and bullish about the mm -hmm. future of Web3 uh, in, in Dubai. We've also seen uh, positive moves from the regulators as well uh, and sorry the government as well in terms of looking at developing web3 in a, in a responsible way but also welcoming uh, in entrepreneurs who are looking to build in the space so that's on dubai very quickly on hong kong as well i think uh, uh, in line with what uh, Ramel was talking about uh, in terms of philippines uh, hong kong has been pretty big in the nft market yeah yeah uh, but from a regulatory perspective one of the earliest to kind of start looking at regulating the overall crypto market. Uh, mm -hmm. Quite a few of the like uh, exchanges uh, originated, have their had their bases in Hong Kong before spreading yeah. the rest of the world. So a very crypto native environment there and uh, yeah. significant capital as well. And mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see the evolution. I think we are moving back towards also opening for retail investors in the coming uh, months as in formalizing right. that process with uh, regulatory safeguards, but as a uh, ecosystem, very thriving and I think huh. once you see the full opening of Hong Kong, uh, they will be a good place for, you know, as a hub for uh, East Asia uh, overall for Web3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So you don't think, it, so, it, so it definitely sounds like for me, Monsieur, that hasn't really been much impacted by COVID because of the lockdowns and all that, because I've been hearing that, you know, people don't want to go out anymore. And, but of course, it's, it's thriving. I mean, with Yatsu and Animoca brands, it's like they're, they're launching like a $2 yeah, billion dollar metaverse fund. So, so it, it, it kind of seems like such a different picture. It's like the, the, the picture on the street is like, nothing's really happening. No one's really going out. But you're saying that but the scene is actually thriving. Is, is that what's happening? Said, yeah. So we are talking about Web three, right? It's all about and, and Hong Kong, digital, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And digital, a lot of it. So exactly. your in person meetings are important, yes. But the whole um, point about Web three is is being able to drive life yeah. on, online. But in terms of Hong Kong, uh, a couple of clarifications. Hong Kong never had a shutdown. Never shut down even for one day, right? So you had restrictions on movement, but you never had a lockdown in Hong Kong. So people could go out. They were, they are still in place regulations around uh, mask and everything else. But since a couple of months, uh, you know, they've kind of reformed the uh, quarantine procedures for incoming mm -hmm. passengers and tests. All yeah. of that have been eased up. But from a yeah. local community, as I mentioned, given Hong Kong's been in the state, a lot of people have been in the virtual assets world in Hong Kong for 10, 12 years. You yeah. do have a thriving community, and NFTs yeah. are actually even being promoted by the government. Uh, and other bodies uh, when during the Hong Kong FinTech week was an example. Yeah. Uh, Vivian Tan released uh, certain uh, products based on that. So right. I do see that as a thriving possibility. And in mm. terms of, uh, you know, you, you have two elements to have one being what it offers on its own and one uh, as a bridge for other ecosystems. Yes. I do believe once it's fully open, hopefully in the, in the next year, uh, it will then bring in all the external parties as well to further collaborate. But from a yeah. local ecosystem, it's fairly uh, alive and thriving. Wow, interesting. I, I have to go. To, I haven't been to Hong Kong for, for a while, so now I have to go to Hong Kong and uh, Dubai. Uh, yeah, so take Emirates, you... fly into Hong Kong, uh, Dubai, right? and then go to Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah, no, for real. And Jawan, I mean, you've lived all over, right? I mean, you've been Dubai, Turkey, Australia, Norway, UK, and now you're, you're suffering in Dubai. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, I've been there for about 16 years um, in Dubai as a hub to, to go to different places. Mm. And one thing they do here is they move really fast. You know, when they decide to do something, they do right. it. So while most other countries are talking about doing something, they announce it and they do it. You know, they said, all right, we're going to send someone to Mars and, you know, go reach Mars. I had no idea how to do it. They just go ahead and do it. So, and they put all the force of government behind it as well. And, and they remove a lot of blockers um, in terms of doing that. So you've got a very, very vibrant community. And actually, in COVID, yeah. um, this place shut down, but it opened up quite early. So six months before England, for example. And the main thing about COVID is it actually acted as an accelerator for crypto. It actually oh. moved things along when it came to NFTs because people oh. actually had more, you know, I, th I think it pushed the, the lockdown, the shutdown and COVID actually accelerated people at home doing more things online and yes. more people gravitated towards these areas yes. um, than we'd see in the, in the normal world. So between that and between what they're doing in this country, I mean, so many projects are here. So, like literally everyone comes through Dubai, you know, and you always, without, with, normally you need to travel somewhere, but everyone inevitably is coming here at some point, and you always get to meet them. Wow, sounds super exciting. I've got to make a trip there then. So, you know, uh, other questions for you then, you know, is, is and, 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 and for all of you, uh, what then do you think is the, the next evolution uh how, how are we going to evolve from here i think we some of us touched on work a little bit but what do you think is the next step uh for web3 or uh, maybe I'll, I'll i'll phrase it again or what do you think are some of the obstacles now that we need to or pain points that we need to remove eradicate in, in order to like evolve further and, and and what are those next steps what do you see happening does anyone want to take that on um, uh, maybe let me. Okay. Go ahead, Nicole. Uh, go yeah, first? Nicole. Yeah, no, no, Nicole will go first. Yeah. Ladies um, first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, so I think coming back to the first question, what are some of the uh, next evolution? Yeah. Um, I think I'm still very bullish on DeFi or you know like uh, or decentralized finance. Basically, you have seen the. Uh, I think the embedment or the. The combination of DeFi and a lot of the existing uh, verticals like game, we have GameFi, mm -hmm. now we have SocialFi, we have EduFi. Anything can be can go like uh, you know kind of decentralized finance where mm -hmm. we can embed some sort of 
um, I think decentralized uh, as kind of DeFi based uh, incentives to it. Yeah. So I think basically this is still, I think one of the way to move forward. So we have talked about play to earn, move to earn, a lot of the other areas, like even like uh, learn to earn right now, right? the finance yeah. for instance. So basically, um, uh, put aside, you know, putting aside like the funny side of it, like people talk about like how people are just like going this for the money. Yeah. I think uh, pretty much if we look at it as a from the business perspective, mm -hmm. it's about designing the the behaviors of your users, mm -hmm. like you know, in in a more desirable way. Mm -hmm. And if it's about bringing incentives, if it's about keeping people incentivized, keeping people mm -hmm. engaged with your products, mm -hmm. then basically that's the ultimate goal of any product builder. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to keep this at blockchain and mm -hmm. DeFi actually gives a a more I think savory, um, I think sentiment or some more savory mm -hmm. approach to it. Mm -hmm. So I think pretty much this is still something that I think it's not going to be just enticing mm -hmm. for the web business, but also yeah. for the mainstream business. Number two mm -hmm. is I think with the um, with the obstacles, uh, I think a lot of the a lot of the applications right now, uh, I think still the main problem is with the onboarding for users. And even with, I think Romel is working on Gamify. So I think that pretty much with game, it might be one of the easier kind of vertical to onboard the users. But if we talk about, I think uh, other tools like investment, swap, yeah, DeFi, yeah. etc. It's very hard for a new users to tap in. And I think pretty much with the Web2 uh, community out there, that's like the, the target mm. community that we want mm. to go for. It's not the native, Web3 native community that we are looking yeah. at because it's so small. So as if we want to, even like for game, if we want to onboard 1.5 million gamers out there, we still need a lot of, I think, works on this kind of onboarding, making sure that um, people would not have to experiment or experience a lot of friction when they move to Web3. Then pretty much, even with a very simple app, I think, I'm, I think pretty much we can um, definitely onboard more users. Mm. So yeah, there's a lot of other side on the regulations and stuff, but I think I just want to pick out like, I think the most um, kind of pressing issue in my opinion yeah thank you uh romel uh what is the evolution and pain points obstacles we need to remove um yeah so um i think i uh, i agree with what nicole mentioned right that there's a lot of decentralized and um finance uh involvement on the earn x to earn uh aspect in the uh web tree evolution mm -hmm. and that will give the community the power and the ownership that they are really wanted um, um, and not really tie up in one one thing and the fascinating um, actually when it comes to technology and uh, building what I'm really looking for is this one metaverse world where in all of this uh, uh, NFTs that you bought into a different mm -hmm. games uh, mm -hmm. it's just an example but mm -hmm. um, seeing them in the one world right and mm -hmm. and um if someone will create a project that actually can onboard all of this nft mm -hmm. that came from um uh, a project that were mm -hmm. in they cannot use it anymore but they can use this in this one world and mm -hmm. i i think that's that's a revolutionary for everyone and that will give the 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 power um the trust back to the community that oh uh this is what really NFT is all about. This is yeah. what really Web3 is all about, that they can really jump in because as long as our NFT can just be played in our game, yeah. it really still looks decent, uh, centralized, right? That you cannot yeah. use it on other systems. Yeah. Yes, there's a power wherein you can buy, uh, buy and sell all of this. Um, and the pain points now that we really need to resolve um, is to reduce all of this uh, rug pull project those bad actors yeah. and we need help from the government and yeah. i think this is the time for the government to really uh, take us seriously yeah. that what we do here is really revolution revolutionary and really mm -hmm. disruptive in the system and they need uh we need help from them to really streamline this uh yeah. project this company that being just it's kind of like a mushroom that really uh, just showing left and right right <laughs> I, I think we have a thousand of project that um and yeah. only one percent five percent being uh Viable. left for the wow. after the bear market right wow and another, another new project coming in it's kind of like in and out right 
it, it's just like they taking all this money from the community and then hit and run so um for me i take it seriously and if philippine government will really require us to get all of this sure. um um what do you call that documents permits that what we need yeah. uh, by the way we we really we also secured our sec license here mm. so so very um now the government is slowly taking us seriously and yeah. uh, hopefully that in the next coming years there will be more serious um regulation uh that will be implemented in the uh in this space because uh uh, we we really I really love the technology. That's right. how I fall in love with the with the web three. It's the technology right. behind. It. Right. So I need to roll Rommel out when we do when we do VC pitches. I need to roll Rommel out because that's <laughs> effectively what we're building. So so Rommel, our metaverse that we're building in Virtua is a metaverse which all games developers can connect their projects to, and NFT projects can connect their projects to. We've already done this with Cardano and made an island for their community. We have multiple projects who are looking to have NFT utility, bringing them into the metaverse, use, and not only just, you know, it's not just games, it's like give the community a place yeah. to be. So if you've got a project, we like like Dead Pixels, a whole bunch of them, like we took all the Cardano main projects, we spoke to the teams. They they have their own villa styles, own crypto styles. They have they're gonna have brand hubs where they can come in and people have leaderboards of the game, social engagement. But then also your NFTs. We're encouraging lots of um, a lot of people um, companies to build on top of us like an OS, mm. and then take the NFT and take it into another game. Because yeah. like if you look at because if you look at things like Steam, people yeah. take a game and they mod it. But imagine if that became, you make a game, right? But then you can provide the royalties in it so that another project can change the avatars and even theme the game a bit, change some of the gameplay, publish it as their own game, then you get royalties. So you have your game here, but flavors of your game are, in, are published by other NFT projects to give them utility, engage the community, and tether in the metaverse. So that's sort of where we are. I mean, like we've been building, you know, we, we have about, 250 people we've been building for about five years so we got a whole bunch of stuff around this and we've just you know like any you know this is what i think the future is because i think the future of web3 needs a space first we're all fragmented mm. we're all over the place yeah, we right. need a place where people can come up where there's some let's, trust let's mm. let's connect after this meeting uh i'll, I'll show you some <laughs> of my insight on how you're gonna build that i, I was actually an innovator <laughs> and uh I was I, I worked in IT industry for 17 years and uh, I was one of the pioneer of the big data. So sure. so I really but love. I, I'll, let's sure. connect and actually uh, I, I I love what you're doing. Um, I really wanted to also uh, be part of that revolutionary that you're doing. Uh, it's it just I'll give you whatever. That we need I, I we need yeah. we need DAOs. We need game. Uh, we need DAOs. We need game fire projects, and we also need to go talk to Vara. So this is actually a good panel to be. In. Exactly. Oh, I was nice, just going to say nice. we should all jump into another. We should all jump into another yeah. panel of our own, which is not live. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and not at and not at three a.m. Please, so that I can participate fully. But uh, uh, before we head on to our last question. Uh, this is such a fun panel. I'm learning so much. But sure, what, what do you think? You know, what is, uh, and the question, same question to you. What do you think is the evolution of Web3? Uh, and what are some of our pain points in getting to your vision? Right, I think um, we've had some very good inputs from Nicole, uh, Romel, and Jawad on, on different elements. Um, I think three key uh, factors that need to be built in or uh, further evolved. Uh, number one being... Uh, investor education education has to be at the core of any new asset and a new technology and when you look at web3 it's a combination of new asset class with new technology right so that's and it's been at a hyper speed uh, as compared to all other uh, evolutions which took quite some time to evolve whereas here you're seeing that this evolution happening much sooner so that's number one yeah. number two is interoperability right mm -hmm. so when you think about uh, when there's comparisons done between blockchain and the internet, there's a little bit of false um, understanding that they are similar, right? Mm. But the fact is, you get onto the web and then you type an address and everywhere else the experience is the same, right? And then everything is done at the back end, right? Essentially the same as using a phone uh, uh, and, and things on the Apple phone or Android phone. 
So having that interoperability is very important. Whereas with blockchain, with multiple protocols, with multiple ways of interacting, the man on the street, man, woman on the street, the person on the street does not necessarily understand that. Right? They just want mm. the end product. And that is True. very important. Is, is simplification and interoperability so that as, as Roman was mentioning, you know, if I have an avatar, uh, an NFT avatar, say, of, of, a, of a, a Versace jacket and I want yeah. to, or a Gucci, Gucci is an example that they're using in fact, right? And I want to go from sandbox to decentralized, I should be able to do yeah. that without any issues or for that matter, any random metaverse that somebody else is privately developed, right? So that's yeah. going to be second important. The number three element in terms of evolution, and this is going to be important, Across Web3, we, we, we kind of narrowed it down a little bit to the metaverse and NFT world, but mm. broadly speaking, when you look at Web3, I still believe we are at very early stages of Web3. We're probably mm. mostly 2.5 uh, mm. uh, in reality, uh, in terms of adoption and yeah. um, adapt, adaptation, as it were, um, is enterprise, right? So yeah. when you're looking at the likes of Accenture, uh, a bunch of the banks and others starting to use um, virtual reality and metaverses for onboarding, for example, Accenture is doing that for training their 150,000 staff, right? Uh, they've, they've announced it, they're, they're trying to build on that. So technology underpinning that is important, but you also have enterprise versions of uh, different uh, metaverses, if you can call it that, or virtual reality uh, elements, uh, where you, you so, so when Microsoft is developing things, they do think a lot about how you know, enterprise meetings can be done. So yeah. there is a model which can be very beneficial in the sense that uh, you could actually have a sustainable, profitable model because enterprises mm. pay for things and they're used to doing that. Whereas mm. your, your tokenized, your, your business model changes when it's a retail market. Quite often, mm. businesses are running to chase and acquire customers and spend a lot. Mm. And you know, sustainability becomes a bit of an issue because you're relying on VC money in a downturn that's even more challenging, right? right. Even if you paid in crypto. So to yeah. flip that around, if you look at enterprises, that's a good way where there's one market. Mm -hmm. um, it's a similar evolution to what happened in fintech. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look between 2010 to 2017-18, uh, B2C mm -hmm. fintechs raised the majority of the funding, mm -hmm. whereas from 2019 onwards, B2B started picking up and now mm -hmm. B2B fintechs raise more money and the world's mm -hmm. largest fintech in terms of Stripe or even Ant Financial for that matter, mm -hmm. tend to be very heavily B2B. Right? Yeah. So I think that evolution is something that we need to pay attention to. And yeah. that helps in terms of consolidation, helps in broader adoption. As more enterprises are adopted, that will go down to their users as well. Right. So rather than a, you know, so you have both ways of bridging it, but these would be the three main elements I think are important. Education, uh, interoperability, and uh, enterprise development. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's super quotable. Now we have like our last seven minutes, like this panel has just flown by. I'm not even feeling like it's 4 a.m. for me at this point. So our last seven minutes, we'll just go around the room. Each of you have about like two minutes, a minute and a half, two minutes to uh, speaking of pitches, Jawa, I think you just gave me an idea. Like if you had to pitch to all of us here, uh, what you folks are doing, give us a pitch and you'll tell us, share with the audience, folks um, listening in. I mean, what is it that you're doing? Do your two-minute uh, investor pitch. Let us know what you're up to. We'll start with you, Romel, since you obviously uh, did a great pitch to Jawad, and he's like, I want to connect with you. So let's start All with you, right. Romel. Uh, let's start with your little pitch. What is it you're doing? Yeah. Okay. So so right now, we're, we uh, we are developing the probably the first ever um, GameFi industry, the uh, GameFi project that actually uh, focused on sustainability, liquidity, and also the... Uh, the product, the services. It's a, actually a AAA game. That's uh, the first first person and a third person shooting game uh, that really have been involved with a high intensity of fun, collaborative uh, game. And actually, uh, we, we will be, this is actually our third iteration. Mm -hmm. The project is really evolved from, from, from a stick man to really a AAA game. So uh, we will be releasing our new updates and I would like you to all invite to visit our website soon. Uh, we will be releasing the new upgraded assets, NFT assets that we have in the gameplay. Uh, the first ever game five that's actually uh, have the esports element. We're in. Awesome. We all have fun, collaboration, 
and really strategic game. Great, great pitch. Uh, tell us your website so that folks can log on. What's your website? Where do we go? Okay, our we website right now is, uh, you can visit at uh, www.arcusgame.com. So Very cool. it's also included on my LinkedIn, my LinkedIn, Romel Carlos, search me. And uh, also I'm a business entrepreneur actually with a lot of businesses. So if you happen to visit here in the Philippines, please DM me. I have a van and Wait, travel agency. I can Done. help you out. I'm there. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm so, very busy. Was, I go to Hong Kong, Dubai, and now Philippines. Awesome. Yes, yeah, well, please. <laughs> what about you, Mashir? Like, if you had to do a pitch, give us your pitch. Tell us how to find you, how to connect with you, Mashir. Um, I'm, 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 you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, that's the best way to connect with me. Um, I, I look for uh, look to connect anybody in the ecosystem broadly. Uh, happy to have any discussions. You're looking to understand about the markets uh, and other things. Uh, and yeah, look, uh, I think it's an evolving space, as I mentioned, a lot to grow. Uh, sometimes we don't realize that the size of this market relative to the broader market is very minuscule. Uh, mm. We talk about the $2 trillion fall of crypto over the last six to nine months. Uh, Apple, sorry, Facebook, Microsoft and Amazon alone collectively have lost $2.5 trillion in that mm. same time. Right. So just to give an example of three companies versus a, uh, an ecosystem which has uh, thousands of companies, we have a long way to go in this space. So these are, as they say, birthing pains and growing up pains that will continue in the ecosystem. But what is required is a, is a broader understanding, not just of the self, but of the community. And in crypto, I think yes. community is, 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 is at the heart of everything. But realization on where you stand, knowing your rights, knowing how everything is no blind trust. I think that's, that's a key element. And and then looking to protect everybody who are involved in the ecosystem is going to be very vital going forward. Thank you. Well and said. Thank you yeah. For having me here and uh, your lovely uh, moderation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bashir. Well, definitely very well said. And and, and thank you. I, I, I take the compliment. Jo Jawad, if you had to pitch, tell us your pitch, where to find you, okay. how to connect with you. Okay, that, that, that would be good practice. Okay, so, um, so virtual.com. Um, is our website. We're building um, a metaverse, which will be one of many, but our primary focus is on being the gaming metaverse, full stop. And the idea is that we're going to bring in games from Web3 and Web2, because ultimately um, the metaverse needs to be a persistent place which will have further, with further engagement with communities. So basically we are provo we, we're partnering with brands and games companies to build content on top of our metaverse, as well as creating reference games ourselves. We've got stainless games in the UK, one of the biggest game publishers in the world, the developers in the world making our first game. We have in-house games being produced, and we're also partnering with other um, games companies to build on top of our metaverse. We're also partnering with brands and celebrities. So we work with Kevin Hart to do screening room um, um, in our metaverse of his latest um, um, mini series that it produced. We're on the Williams F1 cars. We're part with multiple movie studios because the idea is that Virtue is going to bring gaming and brands together to bring in users from Web 2 and Web 3. Web 2, persistent virtual world with DLCs, Web 3, metaverse with NFTs. But at the end of the day, the players will all come in if you can create one place right. where everyone can mix. And we won't be able to do that just engaging the Web 3 audience. We've got to bring yeah. the world in. And that's what the virtual metaverse is about. So you can connect with me in LinkedIn and um, just come to our website. And we do have our big land sale happening on Monday, which will introduce awesome. a monster, which will introduce the monster verse. So imagine you've got a villa, but opposite a Jurassic Park sort of place with Kaiju, Kong, Godzilla, Goliaths, monsters roaming around. So what we're doing is very different and it'll be tethered by games. So we're building something different and um, you know, I'd encourage you to pop over and have a look. So there you yeah. go, that's my pick. We're so excited. Uh, so our last word, I'll have a female panelist, Nicole, I want you to have the last word. Again, uh, give us your pitch. Tell us how to connect with you, Nicole. Um, so yeah, I, I started my blockchain journey as a community builder. I have always been a community builder and I will always be a community builder. So I started my blockchain journey back in 2017. Uh, so have been working with a lot of the projects in Southeast Asia and with APAC DAO. So we want to make it take it to another stage. For now, we've got uh, 1,500 members from 600 projects in 10 countries in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So we want to build a funnel for Web3 builders uh, with Web3, uh, with networking and meetups to support them with networking, talent matching, and also with decentralized launchpad. So we want to be like the gateway for you to go to Southeast Asia. So we are also connected with a lot of the projects here, Mushir and Romel. 
And we're also looking forward to having you in our community as well, if you want to have our support. Uh, please do find us uh, at FACDAO. We are active on Twitter and Telegram uh, and Twitter uh, and LinkedIn as well. You can find us at uh, APACDAO. And I'm available as well on LinkedIn if you want to reach out to me. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, Moreka, being very coherent, even if it's uh, <laughs> like early morning <laughs> there in the US. And uh, everyone else who contributed to this uh, spectacular panel. No, this really is a spectacular panel. So again, thank you all. Uh, I'm Loretta Chan. We're signing off from the Global Metaverse Carnival 2022. And the panel you're just listening to is the next evolution of Web3 and the Metaverse. And once again, big thank you to all our panelists, Jawad Ashra from Virtua. We have Romel mm -hmm. Carlos from Arcus. We have Bashir Ahmad from FinStep Asia. And of course, we have Nicole Ang um, from APAC DAO. So thank you, everybody. And we'll definitely jump on our, our own private call sometime soon. See you all, folks. Okay. Let's thank be you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.